Hello hires, so this is the next stage. Once you actually know what DNA is made of, and I mean with complete precision, that you can draw a nucleotide, that you can do your numbering on your carbon, you know the difference between 5' prime and 3' prime for direction on your double-stranded double helix with anti-parallel strands. What we now need to look at is how you replicate it. First key point, for DNA replication, it, this is absolutely essential in a cell. If you're going to make a new cell, then you need that new cell to have exactly the same information as the old cell, because otherwise your cells don't function properly. Um, so it must be perfect and letter perfect. Your A's and T's and G's and C's must be exactly what you want they were originally. Okay. So what we found is that DNA replication is something called semi-conservative. So semi, as in a semicircle, would be half. And if you conserve something, then you keep it. Keep. Um, so basically what that means is that we keep half of the original DNA in the new DNA strand. And this is really clever. Um, what it means is that you're going to pull apart your DNA and you're going to keep both of those original strands and copy new ones onto those strands. Um, so it took a while for them to figure out exactly what was going on with this, but there are some, a couple of really famous experiments that explained how it was working. So this was the big the big one this is the messelson stahl experiment so what they did was set up dna which had been labeled with different isotopes of, of nitrogen so what we have here is a it looks bigger obviously on the screen but this is a tiny ultra centrifuge tube so something that spins around really really fast um, this is the tubes that go into them and what you have here is a density gradient so the heaviest stuff is down here and then the lightest stuff is right up at the top so if you have dna which has been made with n15 in their bases because remember the bases are nitrogenous bases so all the nitrogen in those bases has nitrogen 15 in it so it's heavier than the nitrogen 14 bases so if the dna is made with n15 then you end up with a, a band of the dna pretty close to the bottom of the, of the tube if you do it with N14, the band is quite close to the top. So what they did was start with the parental generation. So basically this is them starting off. They were all N15. And then they incubated that with N14 bases. So any new DNA is going to be made with N14. But what they found was in the first generation, all of the DNA was not N15 size and it wasn't N14 size, it seemed it was in, in between, or weight, I suppose, or density, I should say. So what they said is, well, all the DNA then is half and half, half the old and half the new. And then they took the second generation and they discovered that now what you had was half of that now becomes N14 and half of it is N15. So to show what, what they figured out, in generation one, Here's your double-stranded DNA, both made of N15, which is why it's this heavy. In generation two, they have a heavy and a light, which is why you're in the middle bit here. In generation three, sorry, well, second, sorry, second generation, parental first, second, um, you had these two possibilities to start with. And this one would match up with some more N14, and this one gets some more N14. So this one up here is now all the way up at the top, and this one here is in the middle. And you can figure this out keeping going. So you always end up with some of that very, very original strand is kind of sticking in the middle point, but you're getting more and more that's going up into the high point with the N14. And by the fourth generation, you're down to like 12.5% at the midpoint and 87.5% at the top. It was a really clear cut experiment. It was absolutely, this is what's happening. So to make it work, you're going to have to learn this list, basically. You need to have template DNA. That's kind of obvious because we've said you have to keep half of the original. So therefore, you're going to have to have some original DNA. Okay, we need to have nucleotides. 
so that's kind of obvious as well so you need your literally your whole thing it has to be your phosphate with your deoxyribose sugar attached to the base but you're going to need a whole pile of a's a whole pile of t's a whole pile of g's and a whole pile of c's okay so tons of nucleotides um you also need things called primers which will come back to exactly what they're used for but you need primers these are things which help the dna polymerase which is the enzyme lock on and that's the next thing we need we need enzymes and you're going to have to learn the list of these we need something called helicase we need something called dna polymerase and we need something called ligase you may have heard the name ligase in genetic engineering but not necessarily so these three you're going to have to learn what they do there are others there but those three you need to know lastly we need energy and energy in a cell we mean atp so these are your five things that you're going to have to see you need for dna replication and you're going to have to know more detail on the enzymes right so how this works in a few words if you're going to list it you're going to untwist the dna so flatten it out effectively you're then going to unzip the dna so you don't want to break the backbone because if you break any of the backbone you're going to destroy the code but if you peel it apart exactly like a zip uh, by breaking the hydrogen bonds you open up the pairs you can then pair up for all the opposite pairs so if you unzipped an at pair on the a side you could put on a t and on the t side you can now put on an a so you've now ended up with an at and an at so pair up you then need to stick those backbones together because your little hydrogen bonds are not going to be enough to hold the the whole of that that strand so you make your sugar phosphate backbone up the new strand and then you retwist it together and you've got two identical daughter molecules with half of the original strand so i'm going to show you a little clip here um this clip is also on the files so you can um, and I'll put it on the page so that you can look at it again if you want to. The structure of DNA that Watson and Crick discovered suggests how genetic information is passed on. Before a cell divides, the double helix unwinds and the two strands of the DNA molecule in the nucleus separate. Each strand is then used as a template for the construction of new DNA molecules. The replication of DNA is simple in theory, but much more complicated in reality. The precise details have only recently been worked out. Take a look at the animation called Replication Mechanism to see what actually happens at the molecular level. Okay, so that is very simple but it does give you a nice little view of what they're talking about. The second one that they're referring to is at the end. Okay, so the level of detail that you need to be able to do. So the first thing I said was you had to untwist. So this is the first enzyme that's involved. It is called helicase. So I think that one works okay as a name because you're talking about something that is removing a helix. So helicase is okay, I think. Um, and why you need to do that is because you need to get into the bases so helicase not only untwists it also does the unzip thing and what you end up with is something called the replication fork so here is your original kind of dna strand still twisted up here and here's your helicase and it's locked in to the point this point here on the on the dna strand and it is working its way up the way so it started down here started way down here with the two and then it's kind of worked its way up and as it's worked its way up it's just kept on pushing it flat and and on breaking these bonds here so it's snapping the dna um, apart by the hydrogen bonds but it's not wrecking this structure here so we actually have two good full strands that we can work on okay so the first stage is to untwist and unzip using DNA helicase producing a replication fork. Next stage. Okay, so we're on to the next enzyme, and the next enzyme is really the one that does all the work. Okay, this is DNA polymerase, 
So a polymer is a large molecule made up of monomers, i.e. smaller ones, and obviously making DNA, and it's an enzyme that does it. It's a reasonable name for this one. Okay, so it does all the work, but it has certain issues. Okay, and the first issue is that it can't attach to the DNA particularly well. In fact, it can't do it at all unless it has a primer to help it. These are the, the things that I mentioned in the list. Okay, if this was part of your your DNA strand, one that has been ripped open. Um, I'm not going to go the rest of the way. So this is all going along. Okay, so this helicase would be up here, twirling it about and and unzipping the hydrogen base pairs. So this is now free, but the DNA polymerase can't stick on here. So what it needs is a little short section to kind of help it attach, and the short section is called primer. So you attach it with complementary base pairs. The primer is actually made of RNA, so instead of the normal, what we think of as ATGC being the normal complementary base pairing, in an RNA pair it's A to U to uracil. So this would actually read as U A A C G going this way. Okay, And the DNA polymerase can now attach. The other thing is it can only read from 3' prime to 5. So when you unzip the actual molecule, there's only one of them that it can actually lock on to. So a wee, wee primer would attach on here, and then the polymerase, which is a big blob, attaches on and starts reading. And that's fine. This one, however, is a problem. And this is the lagging strand. So what we mean by the lagging strand is that you have to wait until enough of the strand has been exposed that the DNA polymerase can get into the three prime area. So what's happening here, here's your your original leading strand, it's quite happily just chuntering away and as soon as this opens up it just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. But this one here, this bit, this DNA polymerase molecule, had to wait until there was enough space for it to kind of get in. Okay, so what's happening here is enough has, has been unwound that it can get into a three prime bit, get a primer on there and work its way down, which is great except what we end up with is little gaps in between each of these bits that have managed to form. So here would be the first one that managed to form, so the DNA polymerase locked on here and read down, fell off when it got to the end. Here's another one which is locked on and is now reading down, but when it hits this point here it's going to fall off and you're going to still have a gap between these two strands. So this bit in here, this gap, this point between the phosphates and the and the nucleotide that you need to, or the two nucleotides you need to join up, you use ligase to do that. Now you may have heard of ligase um, if you were looking at genetic engineering. Okay, so this video shows a really good detailed mechanism, but in more detail than you need to know. Using computer animation based on molecular research. We are now able to see how DNA is actually copied in living cells. You are looking at an assembly line of amazing miniature biochemical machines that are pulling apart the DNA double helix and cranking out a copy of each strand. The DNA to be copied enters the production line from bottom left. The whirling blue molecular machine is called helicase. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix into two strands. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules.